18th of August, 1966, near the village of Long Tan, Vietnam, a decisive battle took place. In this dramatic encounter, 108 Australian and New Zealand soldiers fought off more than a thousand Viet Cong sent to destroy them. If the Viet Cong had won this battle, the Vietnam War might have ended much earlier for Australia and New Zealand. But the fierce Viet Cong attack failed. Why? And why has the Battle of Long Tan become the rallying point for Australia's 50,000 Vietnam veterans? In 1965, the army of the Republic of Vietnam was losing the war against the communists. The Saigon government was near to collapse. The United States intervened. It escalated the war and called for Allied support. South Korea, Thailand, the Philippines, Australia and New Zealand sent troops. General Westmoreland, the United States commander in Vietnam, assigned the Australians the task of breaking communist control of Phuoc Thuy province, east of Saigon. Phuoc Thuy was known to United States intelligence as a likely staging area for a massive communist attack on Saigon. Viet Cong supply lines passed through Nui Dat in the centre of the province. In a bold move, the Australians occupied Nui Dat, disrupting the Viet Cong. But the Viet Cong at that time were more concerned with the Americans. To defeat the Americans, we had to increase our forces. The Australian mercenaries were at first only a minor problem. Our forces outnumbered the Australians. Our 5th Division consisted of 274 and 275 regiments, supported by troops from North Vietnam, plus D-445 guerrilla battalion. D-445 also had some support from the population. For we were fighting a people's war, and we mobilised the people to fight. Our forces could easily hide among the local people. We wanted to liberate the people from the corrupt Saigon government and provide land. With only the 5th and 6th battalions, the Australians were outnumbered 4 to 1. The task required at least 3 battalions, but recruitment was low in this time of full employment, and conscription had not yet taken effect. To increase surveillance, the Special Air Service was sent. The Viet Cong called the SAS the Phantoms of the Jungle. The 5th and 6th battalions were supported by artillery batteries from New Zealand and the United States as well as Australian artillery, a squadron of armoured personnel carriers, engineers, light reconnaissance aircraft and helicopters of the Royal Australian Air Force. Brigadier Jackson, the Australian commander, could call on the United States Air Force and an American cavalry regiment located to the north, plus a division of American infantry. As well as outnumbering the Australians, the Viet Cong were also dedicated soldiers fighting on familiar ground. We have to humiliate the Australians or lose face with the people. But the American forces are our main target. By defeating the Australians first, we will learn how to defeat the Americans. Our liberation forces are not afraid to fight the Australian mercenaries. The Vietnamese were a war-hardened people. They had expelled Genghis Khan's army and later the Chinese the Japanese and the French. Lieutenant Colonel Kiem was commander of the D-445 guerrilla battalion, the natural enemy of the Australians in Phuoc Thuy. The local people were not happy with the arrival of the Australian and New Zealand troops at the Nui Dat base. We knew that they would interfere with D-445's operations and separate the people of Long Tan from our liberation forces. 
We were therefore ordered to give the foreigners a warning to leave and for them to stop imitating the Americans. What started in 1966 as a communist insurgency had now become open war. The Australian strategy was clear. The Viet Cong had to be defeated in battle and their support from the people cut off. For the 5th and 6th battalions alone, this task was not easy. But from day one, patrols protected the base, even as it was being built. Trees were left to provide concealment and shade. American bases had been bombarded by elusive Viet Cong mortar teams. The Americans called them the Shoot and Scoots. The Australian, Brigadier Jackson, was determined that Viet Cong teams would not mortar Nui Dat. And he surprised friend and foe alike by establishing Line Alpha. Line Alpha was the area within Viet Cong mortar range. All Vietnamese living inside Line Alpha were resettled. The Vietnamese could tend their farms by day, but anyone found inside Line Alpha at night without permission was liable to be shot on sight. Thus, a huge area of Phoc Tri was declared off limits to the Viet Cong. That was an impudent step. The Australians began a civic action program to win over the people. The civic action policy prohibited brothels and shanty towns near the base and protected village economies by restraining Australian spending. The Viet Cong told the people not to trust these men they called Uk Da Lois, the men from the south, and the civic action campaign was resisted. The Viet Cong welcomed the start of the monsoon season as the slush and cold made life very difficult for the Australians. One digger commented, this is the only place where you can be up to your ears in mud and still have dust in your eyes. Another soldier wrote, Shoes, boots and Bible go mouldy quickly. The termites half devoured my toilet roll last night. The ants ate the plastic covering of the phone lines and the fluorescent helicopter marking panels. There are some dreadful skin complaints up here. I've seen men without a clean piece of skin on them. Before the Viet Cong could be defeated, they had first to be found. This search was the job of Australian intelligence. The Australians had four main sources of intelligence. American, South Vietnamese Army and police, and Australian patrols. Australian intelligence trusted only the fourth source, its own infantry and SAS patrols. In this era, before computers, Australian intelligence graded the reliability of the daily flood of reports on the Viet Cong from A1 down to F6. A1 meant the report was proven. And F6, though, was not false, but unproven. And F6 may really have been A1. The system was virtually unworkable. The Viet Cong needed their intelligence about the Australians. Intelligence about the Australian troops was easy to get. We established perfect intelligence networks among the local people who gave us most of our information about the Australians. We also planted agents in the Saigon Army and the administration to report on the activities of Australian troops. And we obtained confessions from the captured Vietnamese. We also obtained good intelligence from the mass media, such as the BBC, Voice of America and Armed Forces broadcasts. We even monitored the Australian military communications and learned about Australian tactics. Our villagers counted the guns of the task force artillery batteries. The big American 155s and the Australian 105 howitzers always fired one at a time, but the New Zealand guns always fired in a salvo. We called the New Zealand battery the New Zealand Orchestral Group. The Australians had some knowledge of Viet Cong strategy, such as decoy and ambush, and their battle tactics, but knew dangerously little about the Viet Cong 5th Division and the local D-445 guerrilla unit. When the Australians came here, we knew that they had been very successful at anti-guerrilla warfare in Malaya. So although we came from the people and were very good at guerrilla warfare, we rehearsed. 
the Australians were better at anti-guerrilla warfare than the Americans. The Australians were very patient and disciplined and didn't care about hardship. They would suffer more hardship than the Americans or even the South Vietnamese troops. For example, they kept off the tracks and cut new paths. The strategy of the Australians began seriously to confront the Viet Cong. They decided to attack before the Australians could build their base and acclimatize the weather and terrain. So in June, 274 Regiment probed the 5th Battalion's defenses, testing reactions and weak spots. The Viet Cong waved lights on poles, trying to pinpoint the machine guns. But the knowing Australians replied only with rifle fire. The Viet Cong 5th Division Intelligence then presented its assessment of the Australians. While the Uk Dai Lois are arrogant and bellicose, they are hardy and react fiercely to attack. The Australian patrols and their ranger tactics are now a serious problem for our 5th Division. We cannot maintain the people's war while the Australians remain. The Australians must be eliminated. Australian intelligence tried to complete a mosaic of Viet Cong intentions and locations. But too many of the reports conflicted. The mosaic had too many pieces. The dangerous assumption shared by Jackson's staff, the Americans and Canberra was that 274 and 275 Viet Cong units were merely resting up and that D-445 guerrilla battalion was the only threat. The Australians then achieved a breakthrough. Captain Trevor Richards' Hush Hush Radio Research Unit began to locate Viet Cong radio transmitters. Our uh, intercept operators were clever enough to recognise an operator's fist. In mm -hmm. other words, the way he transmitted Morse code, that was one of the ways of identifying a radio station, even though he may have changed his call sign. Now, although it's all that's in code and we could never work out what it was they were saying, we can tell from that type of transmission as to uh, whether it's real or not, whether they're on standby or not, whether they're on training or not, or whether they're starting to plan something. If they're starting to plan something, you start to expect the fact that uh, the amount of traffic will go up, the amount of messages will go up, hence the transmissions get longer and longer. Richards then had a personal triumph. He identified the radio call sign of the Viet Cong 275 Regiment. From then on, the Australians always knew the locations of 274 and 275 Regiment radios. But Richards could never tell if the radios were alone or with large Viet Cong forces. Bob Keep, a junior intelligence officer, began to use Richards' radio fixes to sort out reports of Viet Cong activities. He concluded that 275 Viet Cong Regiment was anything but resting. Somewhere late in July, I became aware that there was a new formation in the area, in addition to D-445, the local uh, VC unit. Uh, I became aware of it through uh, looking at some intelligence that was passed to me by Porky Richards. Unfortunately, in the absence of a declaration of war, the dissemination of that sort of intelligence was very much restricted. And in fact, apart from Porky and myself, only three others had access to it. Ma, John Rowe, Dick Hannigan, and the Brigadier Jackson. Being the junior member of that group, I was unable to press my point of view that this formation was North Vietnamese. Keep's claim was politically very unpopular. But of course, nobody was, would have been anxious to have had a regiment in Phuc Thuy because there was so much, uh, so much of a vested interest in that we, we had control of Phuc Thuy. Uh, Brigadier Jackson, if you remember, uh, said that uh, the whole of Phuc Thuy was under control. Everyone loved us. As you drove along, people waved little Australian flags and so on. But by now, the Viet Cong 5th Division had finalised its plan to attack the Australians. Bad. While the Australians were well trained at anti-guerrilla warfare, Vietnam with its people's war was quite different. We decided to lure the tiger away from the mountain. We would mortar the Nui Dat base as if we were going to attack it. This would draw out a reaction force into terrain ideal for ambush. We would have to set the ambush within the range of the Nui Dat artillery 
because the Australian patrols never move outside artillery range. But if we attack the Australians closely, the task force batteries couldn't be used. We call this tactic fighting by holding on to the enemy's belt. The chosen battle area is the rubber plantation at Zalong Tan. The Australians will not expect a large force so close to their base and helicopters cannot land in the rubber trees or the nearby rice paddy. With the tall tree canopy, we will not be seen from the air. The foreigners will be drawn well into the rubber plantation. D-445 will attack from the southeast and the west and 275 regiment from the north and the northeast to surround and annihilate the enemy quickly, then escape before the artillery arrives. Anti-tank mines will be laid on the road from the south. 274 regiment will ambush any American armored reinforcements coming down Route 2. Throughout July, the Viet Cong stepped up the fighting to learn Australian tactics. In one big skirmish, the Viet Cong held onto B Company's belt so fiercely that the Australians called artillery down almost onto their own positions. And two American Chinook gunships were heavily machine gunned from the ground near the Australian base. But when the Viet Cong retinoited Long Tan to plan their ambush, they were detected. Only a couple of weeks before the Battle of Long Tan, the direction finding fixes I was getting on what we believed to be 275 VC regiment indicated they were starting to move cross country from the eastern border area towards our base. Brigadier Jackson put his base on alert and prepared to defend his perimeter. He sent Bob Keep to ask for American help. The Americans laughed at the idea. They had spent much time and money trying to find the Viet Cong and did not wish to scare them back into hiding. The Americans wanted the Viet Cong to attack the Australian base, a decoy, so that American and Australian forces could then destroy the Viet Cong units. Keep departed, feeling very embarrassed. No attack came, and the Viet Cong 275 radio moved away again. The Australians breathed a sigh of relief and concluded that the Viet Cong had no immediate designs on their base. But to Bob Keep, the visit of the 275 radio meant only one thing. The Viet Cong were, in fact, planning to attack the base in force. On July the 29th, Keep attempted to warn his colleagues. He wrote, the Viet Cong could mount a multi-regimental attack consisting of 274th and 275th regiments with D-445 battalion, either from the east or from the west, or simultaneously from both directions. VC forces in the area pose a direct threat to the task force. This conclusion is supported by usually reliable sources. Captain Mike Wells, Australian military advisor, reported that his Vietnamese agents had news of a big Viet Cong build-up. Wells was an astute officer, and the Viet Cong had put a price on his head. His radio call sign was Violet Honey, a name the Vietnamese could not easily pronounce. But at the Australian base, Wells' agents were not fully trusted. Whilst it was appreciated, the information I passed on, I feel personally that, that uh, it was more put aside as, uh, well, yes, we'll use that as background, but let's get on with what we've got sort of stuff. And, and I wonder sometimes if they realise the, uh, the, the depth of the information, even through the American system, which uh, they would have had access to as well, uh, but in, in the piecing together and the proving of this sort of information. It was seriously enemy movement in the area at that time, apart from just the odd contact uh, the odd probe, two or three here and there. We started getting reports uh, where the soldiers seemed to be a lot more trained. Um, there is a difference between a panic of a local VC letting grip with a machine gun as to one with a controlled bursts uh, and controlled withdrawal. Um, this started to alert me that there were trained soldiers out there or that I'd misjudged the level of training of, of the local VC company. I wasn't sure what, uh, the, but I did know there was something out there and I had no idea what it was, where it was or what it was going to do. But I just had this quite certain feeling that there was something there. SAS patrols brought in sketches of the enemy in regular army uniforms. Australian intelligence overlooked the fact that these were not local guerrillas, the farm dogs, 
but main force troops, the Tigers. Bob Keep found himself the odd man out. It went, when the attack didn't come on the task force base camp the way Keep thought it would, um, he was, uh, he gave me the impression that he was uh, um, really out on his own on this. And he was out on his own. We still, three or four of us, were still fairly well uh, satisfied with what he was saying was correct. In early August, the Viet Cong began to starve the Australians of action to create a false sense of security in the base. The young diggers began to joke about D-445, calling it the Phantom Battalion. Keep became more and more anxious. He bypassed authority and went to Saigon to appeal to an old friend at the Australian Embassy. Bob Keep came down to see him at my villa in Saigon and an old friend, I welcomed him enormously and uh, uh, at dinner that evening he said he had a problem and he said the problem was that he felt that there was a regiment in Phuc Thuy province. Well I said of course this is, this is quite, uh, uh, quite incredible, you know, otherwise we would have known about it but he said he had this hunch. Now when an intelligence officer has got a hunch then you follow. Well I then the very next day went into my sources behind the green door and I put it to them, it's very circumspect terms, I said, you know, what have you got on, on a regiment in Phuc Thuy? Uh, they, of course, were, were as, were as um, uh, incredulous as I was. Nonetheless, we, we put the searchlights on, and when I say we put the searchlights on, that means we, we put the whole array of signals intelligence, um, agent reporting, everything which we had, the whole searchlight was put on Phuc Thuy province. But after three days, uh, there was nothing. And uh, I got on the phone to Bob Keep, who'd gone back by that time to Phuc Thuy, and said, listen, Bob, I, I put everything into this, and uh, there's no evidence whatsoever of any major formation in Phuc Thuy province. Chance then intervened. Bob Keep fell seriously ill and was evacuated to Australia. Without Keep, the belief that the Viet Cong had abandoned Phuc Thuy became stronger than ever. We will attack the Australians on the 17th of August before our National Liberation Day. We know that a big Australian defeat will unseat the Australian Liberal Government and influence the Manila Peace Conference. Australia's losses will discredit America and her puppet allies and end the war early. I think that Bob Keep was like most good intelligence officers throughout history who blown the whistle. He had this hunch there was something was there. And it's quite wrong that, that um, the system wasn't flexible enough to have run with his, with his hunches, because even though they had come to me to have it checked out, and even though we had mounted this, this incredible surveillance capability and come up with a negative view, I think the people who were in Phuc Thuy themselves could perhaps have paid more attention to his warnings. But there's no doubt that um, it was, I think, one of the, the biggest intelligence blunders of the war. Reports of Viet Cong movements continued, but still failed to convince. On the 11th of August, an agent reported a Viet Cong battalion at Long Tan rubber plantation and two Viet Cong companies south of Long Tan village. While flying near Long Tan on the 13th of August, a helicopter's glide path indicator detected a Viet Cong transmitter. A reconnaissance pilot saw new tracks near Long Tan Plantation. I was flying around that area with uh, an American uh, Air Force officer. He was attached to the task force at the time and he had the job of the day to look around and find landing zones for helicopters. And uh, that took about three and a half hours. And while we were looking around, I could see quite a lot of signs that the tracks, roads and things had been used fairly extensively because of the muddy sort of terrain there, any tracks in that showed up extremely well. Suddenly, Richards again plotted the Viet Cong radio, moving towards the Australian base. He alerted Jackson. This time, Jackson sent out A Company of the 6th Battalion. Could this mean that 275 Regiment was approaching? To protect Richards' cover, A Company was not told about the 275 radio. I think it was on day two of the patrol around about the 16th of uh, August. Uh, it was qu again quite funny because uh, the whole company, that's every platoon, one, two and three platoon, including the company headquarters, all had contacts within a matter of about 60 to 90 minutes. And uh, so that automatically let us know that there was some enemy in the area. An SAS patrol well to the east of Long Tan found signs of the Viet Cong, but these were not seen as a threat. 
Jackson's staff saw no warning mosaic forming. The 275 Regiment had been sighted in a dozen different places at once. Like the American command before Pearl Harbor, no one was really in the mood to be attacked. But on the 16th of August, a warning came from the US advisor at Duk Tan, 12 kilometers to the north. I was in his office and noted on his battle map uh, on his wall uh, two large sweeping red arrows that were coming down from the northeast, uh, down uh, south, and then pointing west towards the Nui Dat base. Uh, both of the arrows uh, indicated uh, movement of uh, regimental battalion sized group of, uh, of VC uh, units or formations. Uh, I found this somewhat startling as we weren't aware of such moves. A Company and SAS patrols had found no big units in that area, so the American warning lacked heavy proof. D-445 was in the Maytown Mountains at this time. We rehearsed the ambush with some of 275 Regiment using a big sand model that we made. On the night of the 16th, we marched into Long Tan and deployed between the Long Tan Committee House and the middle of the rubber trees. In the pre-dawn darkness of the 17th of August, a 275 team fire on Nui Dat to decoy out the Australian patrol. The bombs wounded SAS soldiers, engineers and artillery. The problem was we were getting indications that these shells and mortars were being fired from all around us. I mean, if, if one believed uh, all the reports coming in, we were being attacked from all sides. When I went into the command post to start firing some counter mortar missions, um, we had to prize about 20 people out of the command post. They're all trying to cl clamber in to get some protection. Yeah, number two gun took a, uh, a recoilless round uh, in the uh, sandbags that uh, protected. Um, I think it blew someone off the top of the bund at that particular time. Um, there was a little bit of a concern that the, uh, the enemy was a, a lot closer than uh, first thought. As the Viet Cong bombs rained in, the artillery's radar tried to pinpoint their firing positions. But, crazily, the radar showed the Viet Cong to be firing from a thousand metres below sea level. The radar was tracking a particular bomb for two or three seconds and then flicking off that bomb onto another stronger signal and, and, and this is what happened. So the radar was, was, the radars were having a problem giving us any sort of location. In fact, they weren't giving us any location. As the bombs landed, the Australian base expected a massive Viet Cong attack out of the darkness. But no attack came. Using a pre-arranged firing plan, Australian artillery opened up towards the sound of the Viet Cong mortar primaries. The Viet Cong shelling suddenly stopped. It was the first defeat of the Viet Cong shoot and scoots. In 1966, I was a medic in the Liberation Forces. On the 17th of August, I treated wounded from the 275 Regiment that had been shelling Nui Dat. The counter-bombardment hit them. The bodies of three of the recoilless rifle team were buried just north of here. The Australians reacted immediately. A Viet Cong mortar attack from within the free fire zone could not be tolerated. So while A Company sought the 275 radio east of Long Tan, B Company was sent out at first light to catch the Viet Cong mortar squad a hopeless task. Again, for security, B Company was not told about the Viet Cong radio. B Company soon found the Viet Cong mortar positions. Blood trails and recent tracks led east. They followed these tracks, but they split, going north, east and south. B Company camped, ready to resume next day. The Australian base maintained its routine. A sudden attack was no longer expected. The intelligence summary for the 17th concluded an attack on the task force is unlikely. But also on the 17th of August, the main body of 275 Regiment arrives undetected at its position just north of the rubber trees of Long Tan. With D-445 to the southeast, the trap is ready. If the Australians take the bait and come out, victory will be easy. On the next day, the 18th of August, it seemed safe enough for pop singers Little Patty and Cole Joy 
to give the base its first concert. B Company resumed tracking the Viet Cong. But two of its three platoons were ordered back to base for a health break at Vung Tau Beach. The one remaining platoon of B Company was too small a force for safety. So D Company, under Major Harry Smith, was ordered to take over the job of tracking the Viet Cong. Smith, an ex-parachute instructor, had made D Company the fittest on the base. Smith was a veteran of the Malayan anti-communist campaign, as was his big, good-humoured sergeant major, Jack Kirby. Half of D Company's young conscripts had never seen action, nor had Smith's three platoon commanders. Most of Harry Smith's young officers and men had come to feel that the Viet Cong had decided to avoid the Australians and had left the province. But their sergeants were veterans, and their old soldiers' instinct told them that trouble was brewing. With D Company was the New Zealand artillery observer, Captain Maurice Stanley, and his radio operator, Bombardier Willie Walker. Stanley's role was crucial, for his radio provided artillery protection for the patrol. Four Australian patrols were then east of Nui Dat. A Company, returning without finding a large force of Viet Cong, B and D Companies, and an SAS patrol farther east. B and D Companies met at 2 p.m., and Major Ford of B Company showed Harry Smith the Viet Cong mortar positions. The 32 men of B Company passed west through D Company's 108 soldiers moving east. As D Company approached the edge of Long Tan Rubber Plantation, they could hear the Little Patty concert. They felt that this was just another routine patrol. The Viet Cong would surely have been in the next province by then. Well, we, we came up out of the Sioux de Bang over a little rise, and there was a patrol moving from right to left across our front. I noticed the patrol that was coming across us, and they had white tape in their bush hats, and I just assumed that they were an Australian patrol that had sort of got out of the way. A group of EC walked uh, between the forward section and the battalion quarters. I saw the VC first, and I uh, thought, that's not right, and I opened up fire, and uh, I recovered an AK-47. The Viet Cong fled east into the rubber trees, leaving one dead. But no one at this stage realised he was a 275 Regiment Tiger, not a D-445 farm dog. When we heard gunfire to the west, we were surprised, for we thought the Australians had all returned to their base. We quickly prepared to fight. When the Australians were 50 metres away, we opened fire and advanced, using the terrain and the rubber trees as shields. We wanted to get close to the Australian troops to besiege them and to avoid their artillery. But the Australian troops fought back very fiercely. Lieutenant Sharp called urgently for artillery support. Captain Stanley, not quite sure of Sharp's position, started to walk the artillery towards 11 platoon from a safe distance. We were getting some pretty heavy fire at this stage. After, once the second machine gun opened up, then they, everybody who was there opened up on us. Some of the uh, soldiers on the far extreme, on the extreme uh, side of, uh, of uh, six section uh, were yelling out that they were in the trees. Uh, and I directed uh, the machine gunner in my section to, uh, to put some, uh, spray some, uh, some uh, ammunition up into the trees and see if we could uh, find what was up there. Um, it was at that point that we, became, we, we came under extreme fire. On the general order, all of our forces had to advance towards the Australians. To hesitate would have caused many deaths from the Australian artillery. Our motto was, hug their belts, even when they are retreating. We besieged the Australians quickly from the north, south and east. To see them advancing on us was uh, not in our training manual. And uh, it was, I suppose, at that stage I thought, well, we're in a fair bit of shit here. Smith then radioed for an American airstrike. A fierce monsoonal storm began. Soon, three US jets appeared above Long Tan, but the pilots could not locate the Viet Cong through the rain. Instead, they bombed the suspected Viet Cong command post nearby. Major Smith 
had directed that the platoon commander of 10 platoon take his platoon to try and help out 11 platoon. The Viet Cong, thinking that 11 platoon was alone, moved to surround it. It was while we were moving in this formation that a large group of approximately 60 to 80 VCs were moving to our left and then in preparation to attack the left flank of 11 platoon. 10 platoon then went to ground with the VC crossing to our front. Once we were in the prone position, we then opened fire on these VC and we killed them either outright or the remaining force withdrew. Drew. We then saw more Australians advancing on our right and we quickly stopped them with our heavy machine gun and mortar attacks. Stopped by the power of Viet Cong fire, 10 platoon was withdrawn into a defensive line around Smith's headquarters. Escape was now impossible, for Smith had too many wounded. Also, 11 platoon was still cut off, and Harry Smith would not leave them. 11 platoon then faced a new distraction. The whole time, the whole the battle was on. The, there was that the bugler, and I guarantee you talk to anybody that was there, they could remember the bugler because all through it, he you know he blew his callings or whatever you like to call them, but every now and then he hit a bloody C I note, and it was so off putting. Smith then sent Lieutenant Dave Sabin's 12th platoon to help, but enemy fire stopped them too. We then attacked the second group of Australians on our left, but there were now more foreign troops than we had thought. Sabin turned north, but came under fire from the Viet Cong attacking the retreating 10th platoon. Ammunition was now very low. Harry Smith urgently radioed Huey Dat for resupply. At Nui Dat, Jackson faced a dilemma. If he sent troops to Long Tan, his base might be overrun, perhaps by 274 Regiment. But the resupply could not wait. At Nui Dat, two helicopters loaded ammunition. Then, Lieutenant Sharp was shot dead. Sergeant Bob Buick took command of 11th platoon. And uh, we're getting to the stage where uh, I could I'd have to do something, so I put in a fire mission to Maury Stanley as DFO, and I've then sent my own grid reference. And Maury Stanley said, you can't do that, and I explained to him that we were, we were completely surrounded, that Charlie was only 75, 100 metres away, and they prefer to go with a big bang than bloody... And all this it sounds quite dramatic now, but that is exactly what happened. Buick's suicidal request concerned Major Harry Honor at Nui Dat. A big worry was uh, the location of 11 platoon, who were the ones who had been overrun. As I thought that they might still be in the ground, some may be wounded, and we didn't want the artillery anywhere near them. Intense gunfire that created smoke. It, uh, 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 there was smoke, steam, fog or mist. Uh, one couldn't tell what it was. But it did help me, in a way, because I could see flashes of gunfire uh, against this background. It was like a screen, about 200 metres distant. It was like a screen which I could either see or not see flashes of gunfire. And in fact, it helped silhouette our own troops and VC who were moving close to me. And that was the only way I had at that time of determining the grid reference at which to open fire. So anyway, he spoke to me and I said, we've got to have it, we're getting overrun. And um, so they sent it in and it landed about 75 metres in front of us. And uh, came right over the top of us and that's a big no-no. <laughs> and I think I requested uh, five or six repeats, which in fact was a total of in the vicinity of about 30 to 40 rounds of artillery. And it all landed no closer than 50 metres in front of us, and that effectively wiped out our main threat was the VC in front of us. Jackson now faced the total loss of D Company, a potential military and political disaster. He ordered A Company to Long Tan to try to break the Viet Cong attack. It then started to rain very heavily. We had uh, communications were extremely bad. We were jammed after we replaced the antenna on our radio that had been shot away again 
Um, and we decided when it started to get dark, I said, we've got to do something. I think the platoon strength down there at that stage of the game was down to about 12. Now, we went out with 28, and there was effectively about 12 of us left. All the rest have been killed and wounded. So there wasn't very much I could do except just get out and run like hell. The survivors ran west with Viet Cong bullets smacking past them. They met Sabin's 12 platoon. Eventually, a company rang up on the radio and said that they were ordering a resupply and that, that the choppers were about to arrive and that they were going to throw yellow smoke. Uh, the penny dropped for me and I realised that the only way I could get the survivors from 11 back is not by going to meet them, but by throwing yellow smoke in their direction as far as I could, uh, hoping that they would see and come back to the yellow smoke. We knew roughly where 11 platoon would be because uh, to both sides of them we could see enemy movement and we were being fired at and we were firing upon enemy uh, to, their, to the 11 platoon's flanks. So we knew what direction we could expect them to come from. When we threw the yellow smoke, there was an immediate hail of fire into the area where the smoke fell, which we'd thrown 50 yards or so out of our uh, own position. As the 11 platoon group arrived at 12 platoon, they were being followed by the enemy. So we then settled them down and had another little uh, battle with those enemy that were following. Having fought off that uh, assault, we then prepared ourselves to go back to company headquarters. The ammunition boxes were dropped right into Smith's headquarters. By this time, D Company had few bullets left. Intense fighting resumed. The APCs with A Company were slowed by the flooded river Sawoida Bank. Sabin, meanwhile, bringing in the survivors of 11 platoon, saw the Viet Cong massing to attack Smith's position. I let the first VC line pass our position, and when the second and third line of VC lined up in the avenues where the machine guns were uh, aligned, I gave the order to open fire. The two machine guns opened fire with all the rifles that I had, and we simply decimated those two lines of uh, VC. The front line, not knowing what had happened, uh, immediately turned around and tried to dash back to where they came from, therefore passing through the two avenues that we had under fire. And I think that whole attack was just massacred on the spot. 11 platoon finally reached Smith's headquarters. They were haunted, haunted men. Uh, the looks of, sh uh, of horror on their face uh, as, they, as they came through. And uh, they had been through a, a terrible morning. We estimated that we were fighting the Australian 6th Battalion. So we wished that our 275 Regiment had attacked sooner than it did. Finally, we located the enemy's headquarters and many of our troops attacked it. Uh, the coming to position was only around about 100 metres across. <laughs> there were massive attacks. The firepower was massive. I mean, they, they obviously lined themselves up, recycled themselves, loaded their uh, machine guns and just came on and fired and fired and fired. At Nui Dat, all gun batteries, Australian, New Zealand and American, maintained rapid fire at Murray Stanley's chosen targets. We were shifting guns, uh, shifting gun ammunition, through the rain and the muck. The lightning had hit the toilet, uh, literally blown the thunderbox to pieces, uh, which was a 44 gallon drum. Uh, absolutely terrible weather. And um, it was these fellows humping this ammunition, quite, you know, almost running with the stuff on their shoulders. And it's about a bag of cement on each shoulder these fellows were carrying. Last light has set in early because of the rain and the tree cover. and. Uh, these pencils of trace are coming at you, thousands and thousands of them, from sort of there and from there and from there, all coming right above the top of the ground. And I go back to what I said about this reverse slope position we were on. They could only fire down to a certain level to skim above the ground as they could see it. And they were fortunately were mostly going just above our head. At D Company, Major Smith saw the Viet Cong moving in behind him. Human wave attacks resumed from his front and from both sides. Unless help came soon, D Company would be wiped out to a man. The enemy persisted in these large force attacks and I knew ammunition was getting critical for the third time and there was no more ammunition to the rear of us. It was then that I realised that we had met a superior force. Although our forces attacked closely, 
the artillery became a problem. I think as the afternoon uh, wore on, I got the feeling that uh, we weren't going to quite make it out of this, so uh, I think I uh, did say a prayer or two, and I thought of my family, especially. And, uh, I was you know, getting really pissed off. Laurie Drinkwater came up to me, uh, or crawled up to me and said, uh, hey Skip, do you reckon we're going to get out of this? And uh, I looked at him and I sort of thought to myself, well the artillery's been falling for about two hours, the army, the armour is about an hour overdue, it's raining like we've never seen before, um, I've never really been seriously shot at and there's some turkey out there trying to kill me, and I looked him straight in the eye and said, oh, I don't think so Laurie, I don't think so. We were moving through young uh, rubber trees and uh, through uh, what turned out to be a fairly uh, sticky sort of weed about waist deep uh, in uh, height. And for this very reason, uh, we virtually uh, drove in on top of elements of uh, the, uh, the VC, uh, which later turned out to be uh, parts of uh, D445 uh, battalion, without seeing them. We only saw them when they stood up in uh, front of us and uh, at that stage we came under fairly uh, heavy uh, fire. The first thing I thought was that, I'd, was that I'd come on D Company. It's raining, you understand, and the visibility's not all that good. As I peered at them, they had webbing and the gear on, and they had bush hats, but the bush hats were round. And almost at that instant, a far right-hand carrier, commanded by uh, Corporal Goss, in fact, came across the radio saying, they're the enemy, and with that he opened fire and then we opened fire across the line. The heavy rain and the battle noise made it impossible to hear the tanks coming, and the high grass of the rainy season made it hard to see them until they were right there next to us. We felt determined and unafraid, and we turned and fired at them. I raised my pistol and fired twice before being shot through the head. The bullet went in one side of my head and out the other. My half of the platoon in the, uh, the armoured personnel carrier that I was in dismounted and so did the other uh, half from uh, the adjacent uh, personnel carrier. We then moved into extended line uh, on the right flank of the, uh, the company and we actually uh, commenced uh, to assault towards the enemy, uh, which at this stage were uh, starting to uh, stand up and stream uh, from left to, uh, to right in front of us. And then I strained my ears to hear and in the background over to the right I could hear rumbling and a swell in my stomach took over and I thought, someone's coming, we're, we're going we're gonna to get out of this. He went forward and, and I should say at this stage there was quite literally a wall of artillery falling between us and where D Company was, which was designed obviously to protect them from the enemy. I went forward through this artillery, which was a pretty interesting experience. I remember actually reaching down and putting my steel helmet on my head. I can't imagine what I thought it was going to do, but I put it on my head. The lights of the APCs came through the rubber trees, came through the rain. I could see the tracer as they were coming through, they were firing. And I thought, you beaut, we're home and hosed. I swung a complete 90 degrees with my carriers. Um, and we swept uh, to the east. Um, the fire that came back at us as we went that way was absolutely incredible. Once the APCs came in, the VC disappeared. That night, the Australians were in bitter despair. They thought they had suffered a great defeat by the Viet Cong. One third of D Company had been killed or wounded, a huge military and personal loss in Australia's small army. But next day, when the Australians re-entered Long Tan Plantation, they were amazed to find hundreds of Viet Cong dead. Later, the captured diary of a Viet Cong commander listed his losses at 500 men. The Australians had won a great military victory. It's my estimation that because of the communication problems that the enemy was having, uh, that he could never identify where the Australians were. Had he been able to do that at any stage during the whole three hours or so, if the enemy commander had simply said to his troops, form a line, stand up, let's go, and they would have just walked all over us, even without rifles, I think, uh, at certain stages when we were running low on ammo. Um, and they would have just uh, been through us like a dose of salts. Viet Cong propaganda reacted quickly to their military disaster. 
They told the local villagers they had wiped out the Australians and that the people could return to their farms inside Line Alpha. The Viet Cong were awarded decorations for heroism against the Australians. The American and Australian press celebrated the Australian victory at Long Tan, ranking it with some of the great stands of military history. President Johnson awarded D Company the rare presidential unit citation for courage in the presence of an armed enemy, and 15 Commonwealth decorations were awarded to Major Smith and his men. But Canberra denied the Young Diggers medals. To save face, Saigon awarded them national dolls. I was actually despairing as to these young 18-year-olds never being in combat, not a great deal of training, and I was completely wrong. Uh, their strength of character, their ability, uh, their bravery, exceptional bravery that they had, was the... I've been in seven theatres of war in all, and I've never seen anything like it. At that stage, I, I originally came from England, and I had still got English nationality. And right at that moment, I just wanted to be an Australian. I was going to live the rest of my life here, but just the bravery of those men was the deciding factor that made me become an Australian. The Battle of Long Tan demolished forever the myth of Viet Cong invincibility and never again did the Viet Cong seriously challenge the Australians. By 1972, the Australians could go unarmed in Phuoc Thuy. D-445 guerrilla battalion became non-operational, reduced to foraging for food in remote areas. Media coverage of the Vietnam War has rarely recognised the Australian achievements in Vietnam. But in Australia, on each Long Tan anniversary, the Vietnam veterans march to tell the world we won our Vietnam War.